half in the bag. Get out of my living room! Hey, Jay. What's that? What did Army Hammer say when his girlfriend left him? What? I want my baby back, baby back, baby back. I want my baby back, baby back, baby back. I thought of that joke yesterday, all on my own. Someone out there in the internet may have also thought of the same joke. It would have to be a boomer. It was probably a boomer and... Uh, no, younger people don't get that reference. That's true. So uh, that narrows down the amount of people that may have come up with that joke. I did not steal it. I may have originated it. Mm. So I'm thinking of trying to sell jokes to uh, the Tonight Show starring Jimmy Fallon. That's about the level caliber, maybe, maybe lesser. That's, I'd say that your joke's a little bit above that. You know what's unfortunate though, Jay, is now that the Packers aren't going to be playing in this the big game, what are we going to watch? Yeah, I mean, what do we have to look forward to now that the Packers aren't going to be playing in this the big game? Well, maybe we could watch some movies. We got all those streaming channels. What about that Black Widow movie? Moved from May 11th, 2020 to November 6th, 2020 to March 7th, 2022. You mean I have to wait that long to not care about a movie? Well, what about Ghostbusters Afterlife? Now that one I'm looking forward to. Move from July 5th, 2020 to March 5th, 2021 to April 5th, 2023. It'll now be out November 11th, 2025. But what about all these other movies that are done and supposedly coming out? What about Shazam 2? Delayed. Thor, Love and Thunder, starring Natalie Portman as Thor? Delayed. Top Gun, Crackpot, I mean Maverick? Delayed indefinitely. The Candyman reboot? Canceled. The new Halloween re-re-re-remake? Shelved. A Quiet Place 2? Delayed, then canceled, then delayed again. Well, that's not some good news. Well, what about Avatar 2? Delayed. Or Avatar 3? Delayed. Avatar 4? Delayed. Avatar Delayed. 5? Delayed. Avatar 6? Delayed. Avatar 7? Delayed. A Avatar 8? And delayed. <sighs> well, what about the Doctor Strange sequel the world's been clamoring for? Lost in the multiverse. I mean, delayed. What about The Batman starring Robert Patton Batman? The canceled. Jurassic World Dominion? It's been delayed five times. It's now scheduled to come out July 39th, 2047. What about Ben Affleck's Dunkin' Donuts order? Bungled. Well, shit. Since we can't look forward to any of the new Hollywood blockbusters, I guess we're gonna have to deep dive some movies on streaming. Sure. I'll, uh, I'll set the remote to random mode. Okay. Boop. Come on, come on, no whammies, no whammies. Big bucks, big bucks, no whammies, and stop! Synchronic? What the hell is that? A movie about truck stop boner pills? Well, I guess there's only one way to find out, Jay. Hit play. Let's watch Synchronic. This isn't the most comfortable seating position to watch a film on. No, we're good. We're good. Here we go. I mean, now I just see the back of your head. Am I in your way? You're completely in my way. Ah, uh, cry! In Marvel Studios' action-packed spy thriller Synchronic, Natasha Romanoff, a.k.a. Synchronic, confronts the darker parts of her ledger when a dangerous conspiracy with ties to her past arises. Pursued by a force that will stop at nothing to bring her down, Natasha must deal with her history as a spy and the broken relationships left in her wake long before she became a synchronic. So Mike, what did you think of synchronics? Uh, I kind of liked it. I didn't love it. Uh, it was a little uh, all over the place and the script was a little uh, patchy and uh, okay at times. It had some interesting concepts, but then it, it failed in interpersonal dialogue and characters and 
Jay, you have a little bit of a backstory with Synchronic, which is why uh, you were very happy when it appeared randomly. I was so excited when it randomly uh, arrived on this film because it's directed by uh, a duo of filmmakers, Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead, and I don't think they've ever come up on our show ever, but I've been a big fan of their movies, their previous movies. They're all very, very, very small-scale movies, very low-budget, uh, very character-driven. Uh, and this one, I guess, is like their biggest budget movie. They have real names in it, Anthony Mackie and James Doohan, of course, from the Fifty Shades of Grey films. Uh, yeah. So tell us more about... Um... Uh, Justin Roiland and Aaron Moorhead. <laughs> um, well, this is it. it uh, you've seen one other thing that they've done. I have. They they famously did an episode of the new Twilight Zone, and by famously, I mean nobody's seen it except us. Right. You'd figured out that somehow during this operation there were to occur a mutation or sabotage of genetic material, and this same gene is manipulated for octopus DNA. <laughs> 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 Sea life could rise out of the ocean and stop life on land. It would do what evolution did it 700 million years ago, put an end to the human species. They didn't write it, and they've written all their movies. Uh, I think the Twilight Zone episode was just a yeah, director for hire kind of thing. You want to exploit the neurological properties of this octopus species. <laughs> Gene edit into a human egg giving human beings the best traits of vertebrates and zephyrobots. So if you bioengineer this gene, you would create a new species of human. Our eyes and skin would have the ability to taste, see, and react without reporting to a centralized brain. Yeah. And so th this uh, feels in the same vein as their previous movies, just, but as a fan of their previous movies, I thought it was disappointing. Um, it felt, I don't know if they were intentionally trying to make something more mainstream, but it felt like Instead of things being left kind of vague and open, they explain exactly what's happening, mm. uh, mainly through Anthony Mackie doing his, he has, he's like doing a video diary, and he's explaining, I, I guess spoilers, but it turns out, like when the movie starts, you're seeing like all this trippy imagery and people are on this drug called Synchronic, and you don't really know what's happening. And it turns out that it's just a drug that can make you travel through time which is weird and simplistic and kind of dumb. Yeah, well the premise is uh, human beings have a pineal gland. Yes, though it's the, the second film in motion picture history to have the plot hinge on the pineal gland. The first being uh, From Beyond, where Jeffrey Combs' pineal gland pops out of the front of his forehead. Please, Crawford! It won't hurt, I promise. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the pineal gland, when you're young, it's there. When you get older, it calcifies, and the pineal gland is responsible for your brain's interpretation of time. And in this film's logic, messing with the pineal gland literally changes time. Because I think they say somewhere in the movie, like, the theory, scientists, the physicists say that time doesn't exist. T time is... is 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 all around us. It's 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 like the rings on a tree. You know, you just, uh, blah, it's blah, it's blah, Christopher blah. Nolan esque gobbledygook to yeah. try and justify the story. Yes, <laughs> it's 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 a very loosely justified story, and in most cases that's fine as long as it's backed up with really really solid characters that you really are rooting for. And this is where the movie falls short for yeah, me. Me too. Um, but then we meet our two characters are two uh, protagonists it's uh they're two ambulance workers emts right the very f opening scene like kind of hooked me they go into like this rundown nasty house the, the movie takes place in new orleans um and there's this weird girl and she's like like tripping out and it's, uh, there's a male victim on the floor he has a knife wound that comes out of his back so they're like oh my god he got impaled by his sword yeah. and there's another girl unrelated to synchronic is has i think she's just there yeah. od'd on heroin mm -hmm. so they give her um, narcan which re um, reverses the effects of uh, opioids but so it's kind of this intriguing uh, little scene and it's kind of done like one take situation yeah that's yeah that's like i was saying about their style it's very kind of loose just yeah following along yeah weird loose and it has this like kind of like um ambient 
creepy soundtrack that makes you uncomfortable mm -hmm. the whole time. And so I was into it. Yeah, even when he's, because what happens is Jamie Dornan's daughter disappears. She's taken the drug, Synchronic, and she's vanished. And they're trying to figure out what happened to her. So there's a mystery angle. Um, and and uh, Anthony Mackie is Jamie Dornan's best friend. And I kind of liked the idea of their relationship. It's a different sort of like two-guy relationship than you see in a lot of movies. Yeah. In the very beginning of the film, Anthony Mackie is wearing a like a sports jersey because his uniform got glitter on it. Right. Because I guess he's an avid strip club addict slash sleep arounder. Mm-hmm. I don't want to say womanizer. I guess that's a, kind of a negative term. He treats his ladies with respect. Sure. He, he, he says, I got to go to work, lock the door. Yeah. He, it's fine. He doesn't say, get out, bitch. Right. He's not awful. Well, that's, yeah, I'm picturing like the Michael Bay version of these characters' yeah, relationships. Yeah. You think so of, like, he, the, like the bad boys movies and that kind of stuff. He is um, kind of his life. Jamie Dornan's got his life together. He has an 18-year-old daughter and a baby on the way. Uh, and then Anthony Mackie's like polar opposite. He's he's a bachelor. He doesn't know what he's doing with his life. He drinks a lot. Uh, he sleeps around. And so that that kind of dynamic comes into play because they have conversations about that. And to me, like that's the meat of the movie. The heart is those two characters. And a lot of their dialogue and conversational moments seem kind of uh, underwritten or the writer's writing out of his pay grade where he doesn't quite, the, it comes off as like, like an 18 year old trying to write 40 year olds. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, he's like, man, my wife, man, when I first met her, I was in love. Doubts, man, they never go away. You know, you think the wedding day is going to dissolve that and it is profound, but you know, the doubts, they never go. I get it, bro. You're a guy in a relationship. I think my marriage is, um, I think I'm getting a divorce. And he's like, but now I don't care because I'm doing it. Like I got the white picket fence and all, and and I come home and from work and she makes me dinner or whatever, but I, I don't know if I want more or whatever, man. <laughs> and I'm like, no, 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 no. Yeah, we don't see each other anymore. You know, she wasn't any good in bed. She was beautiful, but we had too many arguments. That's too bad. My Lisa's great when I can get it. Oh, man, I just can't figure women out. Sometimes they're just too smart. Sometimes they're flat out stupid. Other times they're just evil. It seems to me like you're an expert, Mark. No, definitely not an expert, Johnny. What's bothering you, Mark? Nothing, man. Do you? Do you have some secrets? Forget it. Why don't you talk? Why? Tell me? Forget Come on. it. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, to say the least. <laughs> sure. To say the very least. It's not that bad. Their first movie, Resolution, is almost exclusively two guys in a cabin together. And they're old friends. One of them is kind of like a party guy. He's gone off the, the wagon, and they're trying to, to get him sober. So they're, they're staying in this cabin all weekend. So the whole movie is those two guys. It hinges on those two guys. And they're really great together in the movie. Um, so, and then their other movies too are like that, where they're, they're, they're very focused on just a couple of characters. Uh, in previous movies, they've always been younger characters. Like they did a movie Spring, and it's a guy whose mother dies, and he decides to go on like a backpack journey through Rome. Mm. You know, young, young guy things. Yeah. And this, they're talking about, yeah, like having a wife and a daughter. And it, it feels like I don't know anything about the director's, writer's personal lives. I don't know if that comes from there, but it feels like writing something that you're not overly familiar with. Right, right, right. Yeah. How was work today? Oh, pretty good. We got a new client at the bank. We'll make a lot of money. What client? I cannot tell you, it's confidential. Oh, come on, why not? No, I can't. Anyway, how is your sex life? If that's our, our, our thing that we're supposed to cling on to, it's, it's, a, little, it's a little weak. It's a little on thin ice. Yeah. And then our, our premise is also on thin ice. I'm willing to accept an outrageously unbelievable premise because uh, uh, to popping some kind of pill that messes with a gland in your head won't literally send you back in time. Right. It, it would be fine if their hallucinations made it seem like they were back in time. Like maybe those, maybe the stoners were just like watching a program. I think they did something like that. They showed the TV screen and they're watching some kind of like history channel show 
Oh, there was that some, might have been the opening scene. Yeah, yeah, the opening yeah, yeah. scene. And and I thought, okay, they're what they're see, what they saw on TV is kind of like what's in their head. Yeah, and after they to feel like reality. Drop the acid. They that's what that's what comes to them. Yeah, but no, that's that's why I was disappointed when it was just oh, they're literally traveling through time. Yeah, yeah, and the, yeah, but the uh, the concept is uh, it's younger people. Their pineal gland is still soft, so it's more susceptible when you take the drug. Anthony Mackie, because of his tumor. His pineal gland is soft, so even as an older person, he's able to travel through time. Right. And he uh, has only a handful of pills left. They're not out available anymore. He bought them all up from one store. Mm -hmm. And he's going to uh, try and figure out the mechanics of how this time travel works so he can travel to the time period where Jamie Dornan's daughter disappeared to and rescue her. So that's another problem, is that you have no connection to the daughter character either. She's in a couple of scenes. Yeah, she's just kind of generic daughter. And he is trying to find Jamie Dornan's daughter because? Because they're best friends. Johnny's my best friend. Even though the premise is a little goofy, if the character's were really strong and you cared about him saving her, it would help a lot. Yeah, we, need, we needed more scenes with the daughter. Yeah. And we needed her to call him, um, I don't know, what's his character's name? I don't know. He's Anthony Mackie. It's like, it's like John and Dave or yeah. something. So just, so she's like, Uncle Dave, hey, you know, come on over. And like he's, he, then he has to drop her off at school. And while he's taking her to school, he's like, so you, you're going to go to college? You know, and, okay, you know, maybe I'll think about it. Like he it takes her under his wing. They have a special relationship. I don't think he has a scene with her. <laughs> uh, except for when she's sitting on the paper mache rock. Yes, that's the, the scene. famous paper mache rock. Yeah, they go to a family <laughs> a party. I think it's a baby shower uh, for the, the wife's yeah. baby. And... Um, uh, she's sitting on the paper mache rock. She's doing the teenager thing. And, ah, this is all lame, man. Whatever. And he comes and, over and is just sort of like, "Hey, hey, what's up? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, you, you having a cigarette? Yeah. Okay, bye." Yeah. While it was neat, there is a sequence where Anthony Mackie goes through, and it's like a montage sequence almost, where he's learning about how to uh, use the syncretic drug and yeah. how it works. And I've I've detailed it in my notes. Oh. Um, and it takes quite a while, but that's one part of the movie that's interesting. but That's I think, the strongest part. I like the, the trial and error aspect. Yeah, of, but of, that takes away from the character building with the daughter that could have strengthened the end. Sure. Because we have that, and then we also uh, have the the racism element, which was introduced and never paid off in yeah, any way. Yeah, that's what I wanted to talk about, because it, it the climax of the movie, it ends up being a big part of that, but it feels so unrelated to the overall point of the movie. Bad idea. Bad idea. Oh, wait, why is your oh baby And there we go. Hey, what did you do? No, no, no. Hey, hey, give oh, her back. Wait. I think you busted her. Give her back. Oh, give her back. Oh, oh. Give her back. Racist, baby. Woven throughout the film, there is a theme of racism that... It doesn't feel like they knew what to do with it. They didn't know what to do with it. It wasn't warranted, mm -hmm. and it wasn't paid off. Because, yeah, the setup is Anthony Mackie, you know, they, they go to their... Uh, their call at that house with the sword victim and stuff, and Anthony Mackie's not wearing his uniform. Cops show up, they pull a gun on Anthony Mackie, they call him Tupac, and so there's like undercurrent of modern day racism. Yes. Um, and then there's a couple, but then that kind of goes away after that, and then there's a couple parts when he's traveling through time. The one thing we learn is that there is no racism in the Ice Age. <laughs> That's true. Uh, for, <laughs> first trip, uh, the first time he drops the synchronic. Um, he ends up in a swamp, and he's confronted by a Spanish conquistador. Uh, he tries to kill him, okay? I don't know if that's racism or just, hey, what's that? Yeah. Who are you? I'm going to kill you. What kind of weird clothes are you wearing? Yeah. Um, uh, the second trip is the Ice Age, which was my favorite part, because um, he meets, you know, like a Cro-Magnum man who's walking, and then he sees a... Uh, Wooly Mammoth, and I was like, hey, this is cool. Okay, so he went all the way back to the Ice Age. Yeah. Neat. Yeah. So now he's established that uh, taking the drug in the same spot will bring you back to the exact same spot, which of course comes into play later. Yeah. So he goes back um, to the 20s-ish, um, and then there's like old-timey racists, KKK guys, who are like, what yeah. are you doing here? And, um, and that's the first reminder of that there's supposed to be any sort of theme of it's racism. It's another racist theme but element, but it, yeah. that works as its own scene where it's like well yeah that would be fucking scary for anthony mackie in this situation yes but he doesn't know what time period he's going to go to and, and what sort of situation he'll find himself in. right um so, so it's that, like if that's an isolated scene 
yeah. that's its own thing and that's fine. But now at this point, this is after the opening Tupac scene, and then when we get to the ending, which we'll get to, where it's like, okay, I guess this is supposed to be a reoccurring theme. Stuck in the Rockin 50. Fuck back to the future. Pass was hey. He does, he does bring up racism again when he's drunk in the bar and he's, he's kind of talking to the bartender who's not listening to him and he's like, he's like, if he had the same wacky adventure that Marty McFly did, the results for him would be much different. So that's sure. a comment on, on racism. Yeah. Okay, okay, I'll get to Tim. I just need to know if there's somebody else that might need some help. Brianna. Uh, they discover uh, on one of their calls earlier that she had vanished from a house party. And so a drunk girl says, that's the last time I saw her was sitting in that chair. Then he discovers that the girl wasn't sitting in the chair. She may have wandered off. So all bets are off. Mm -hmm. So then he says, maybe she went over to her favorite paper mache rock. Because <laughs> uh, there's a carving on it. Carved always, mm -hmm. misspelled into the rock. Uh, the, so then the final trip is uh, on, on the, the, the banks of what I assume is the Louisiana River. Maybe it's the Mississippi. Is that where the Mississippi ends down in Louisiana? Might be the Mississippi River. I don't know. There's a Civil War battle going on. And that's our final spot. And that's where he finds the daughter. Yes. So he travels back to the Civil War. Um, midst of a big battle. Yes. And that's, that's a weird note to end the movie on. This is supposed to be the emotional climax of the film. Him saving the daughter, sacrificing himself to save the daughter. The whole racism angle feels really underdeveloped and disconnected mm -hmm. from the main point of the story. Where it's like, that's such a, it feels like it's supposed to be an uplifting ending. Like, oh, he did it. He saved his friend's daughter. But it's so horrible. Like right. that that's his fate. And it didn't feel like it was intentionally supposed to be that horrible. That's just how it comes across. Right. Well, he is a man uh, who is dying anyways. And you add that mix into the mix. Yeah. They should have had a scene like right before he decides to go back to save the daughter, he gets a call from his doctor. He, he, the, the, the brain tumor is, n is not terminal. And he still chooses to and save the daughter. He still chooses daughter. to save the daughter out of selfless, selfless sacrifice. Yeah. I don't know. Which makes it more disappointing when it, because uh, I, I kind of like the middle, the best part of the movie is that middle chunk where he's doing like the trial and error stuff. It's kind of fun. We're seeing his, his, uh, you know, camcorder footage and him trying all these different things. And, but then by the time they get to the end, it reminded me a bit, speaking of Christopher Nolan again, it reminded me of like Interstellar, where it starts as kind of like a, a more straightforward sci-fi film. And then by the end, it devolves into schmaltzy melodrama. Yes. And this is similar. Yeah. For, for an alternate uh, comparison, um, uh, and I, I probably maybe four people out there listening will get this, but if you watch Amazing Stories, there is an episode of Amazing Stories which is very similar to this. The new Amazing Stories. New Amazing oh, Stories. Oh, that's the one episode I watched, I think, with the, the girl from Bly Manor, yes, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. the house, the, 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 the annoying millennial with the phone mm -hmm. uh, who's re repairing an old house and in the basement during a storm there's a barometer which magically transports him back in time. And then he, you know, he falls in love with the woman and they bounce around through time. Yeah. He goes to the future. Trying to find his yeah. last love. And you, know, and, and you end up like kind of caring about those characters. And then in the end, it all gets wrapped up nicely. Mm -hmm. um, in a much more confined, condensed period of time than synchronic. Yeah. It, it works better on an emotional level than synchronic right. does. And, and again, the perfect example because why the fuck does a barometer in the basement during a lightning storm cause someone to travel through time? Yeah. No reason. It doesn't matter. That's your setup. Two, two ley lines intersect there. Yeah. You just come up with some bullshit. I mean, that's a lot of science fiction. It's just, it's bullshit. Sure. And, but as long as you like the characters, you know. Doc, uh, Doc Brown's flux capacitor, we don't need to know how it works. Mm -hmm. That needs a, a bolt of lightning to, to charge it up, and it can travel through time somehow. We don't care. But Marty McFly's adventures, and him trying to, to save himself from being erased from existence, and all that—that's that's magic. <laughs> this movie, not so much.
Well, that was synchronic. Um, let's see what else we got on the I old... get to do it now. Oh, oh my God. Okay. Do you know how to use the remote? Is there a menu button? Okay. Oh, I found it. Okay, here we go. Random okay. mode. Random. And go. Come on, come on. No whammies, no whammies. And stop. What the fuck is this? Promising young woman? Is this a rom-com? I don't know. Some girl works at a coffee shop? Is this like a like one of those Drew Barrymore movies from the 90s? That's what it looks like. Well, I hope the film is promising. Let's give it a watch. We've got nothing else to do. And play. Am I still in your way? No, not anymore. I found okay. a good position. I'm just gonna try to hold this position the whole yeah. movie. Yeah, I have to. I have to put my armor on the back of the chair so I stay in the right spot. <clears throat> I'm gonna try to hold the position. Oh. I hope this movie's pretty short. <laughs> oh! oh my god! Oh my god! Ow! Promising young woman and her grandpa used to be very close, but when Grandpa Jack moves in with the family. Promising young woman is forced to give up her most prized possession, her bedroom. Promising young woman will stop at nothing to get her room back, scheming with friends to devise a series of pranks to drive him out. However, Grandpa doesn't give up easily, and it turns into an all-out war between the two. Well, that was Promising Young Woman, a uh, film starring Carrie Mulligan. From Drive. Uh, from Drive and other things. Uh, and this was a movie I had seen the trailer for many, 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 many months ago. I think this was a pre-pandemic movie that got postponed. Yeah. And it was, I, I think it had a lot of buzz behind it. I don't know if it was from playing at film festivals or something, but people were looking forward to this movie and I knew almost nothing about it. Yeah, the trailer was intriguing. Um, you know, it's a what genre, I don't even know if it's a genre, but a rape revenge film. Yeah. I may have loved it <laughs> if, if it was doing what I hoped it was doing. Okay. I guess we'll get into it. I, I liked it quite a bit too. I wasn't sure what I thought about it at the beginning. I wouldn't say I hated it. You said you hated it at the start? In the middle. In the middle. Okay. Because yeah, it started, it felt a little like, oh, like it's hitting you over the head, messagey. Um, but then it starts to get very intentionally kind of muddled with its morality and what it was trying to do and what it was trying to say. And I appreciated that it was a dark comedy because that helped a lot. Yeah. Because otherwise it would be so nihilistic. I mean, it is kind of nihilistic, but uh, misandrist, right? That's the word. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that dose of black comedy and the energy of the direction really helped carry it along right. in a way that kept you intrigued. Yeah, you gotta kind of walk on eggshells with, with a topic like this. And I, I kind of, at first, I thought that's why it had such high ratings, right? Because the movie is about the, the, the overly masculine, rapey culture of, of frat guys and the denial of a woman claiming she was assaulted. Yeah. And they bring up all those different, like, they, uh, all those different like cliches or excuses that, that uh, come up mm -hmm. after something like that happens. It, it's particularly pronounced in the scene with Connie Britton. Oh when yeah. When she's the dean of the college and um, Carrie Mulligan goes back and she's like, I'm gonna come back to medical school. And she's like, okay. Uh, she has a very hard time after her sexual assault. And I think at some point she died. Mm -hmm. And I, it's implied it was a suicide, but I don't think it's ever specifically said. But then she's like, I get, I get cases like like this, like 15 a day, uh, and boys will be boys. Yeah. Uh, they, People don't want to confront it, they want to write it yeah, off. Yeah, 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 and then... It's, it's a movie that's very much, like, it, it plays so much different. It's about, like, what's happening now and how people are looking at situations like that so much differently now than they were even, like, 10 years ago. Yeah, and that's exactly what this is. It's, a, yeah. it's about 10 to 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, we get accusations like this all the time. It was years ago. What would you say? It, I am a nice guy. It's every guy's worst nightmare getting accused like that. We were kids. If I hear that one more time, I have to give him the benefit of the doubt. Ruin a young man's life. 
and our, our heroine Cassie, played by Carrie Mulligan, was in med school. Her best friend, this happened to her, it kind of messed her up as well. So she dropped out of med school and kind of... Now she's just a layabout, um, lives with her parents. Dad is Clancy Brown, uh, which is great because he's just a nice guy. I was waiting for him to pull out a sword and try and chop someone's head off, and he didn't do that. Right. <laughs> um, but but anyway, I was saying, so with, these, with this, like, subject matter, it's like, well, you better give this a good review yeah. or else. And so I see, like, 99% Rotten Tomato score, and I'm like, ah. Is it, is it because of the message more so than the quality of the movie? Making? Exactly. Yeah. And then you watch the movie, and tonally it's bizarre. And, and it's... In a good way in a way that works. No, it has a very kind of like poppy aesthetic, which is a nice contrast to how dark the subject matter is. Right. It reminded me a lot of Heathers, the Christian Slater, uh, Winona Ryder movie. Yeah. Uh, that, that sort of balance of dealing with this really dark subject matter in a darkly comedic way. It's the, the contrast of like at the end when she's going up to the house and there's like this this creepy slow version of Britney Spears toxic and things yeah. like that. And her character is very like sarcastic and uh, it, it has this weird vibe of like, it kind of feels like it's doing like an empowerment thing. Like she's going to get revenge mm -hmm. on all these people, but it, it's morally ambiguous because she's so fucked up and she's doing bad things too. I think it's supposed to be like an outsider's perspective of, of her situation. We don't ever, because inside her head, things are much darker, and we get the we get the the poppy fun uh, early two thousands rom com look at it. Yeah. From from the audience perspective, mm -hmm. and and I think that's where it just throws me for a loop because <laughs> I'm not quite sure exactly how to take what they were doing or if they were attempting something else and failing miserably at it, or if it was done with surgical precision. <laughs> I really don't know. I mean, it all feels intentional to me. I guess we'll get into spoilers, because I'm curious what you're talking about. We'll get into spoilers. So like you said, she lives with her parents still. She doesn't care about progressing in life. She's very, very stunted by these events in college, and she's, she holds lots of anger. And Carrie Mulligan... And it all kind of comes back to the surface because uh, people related to this event start to come back into her life. Yes, and that's that's the trigger point is yeah. when she, Bo Burnham comes into the coffee shop and he's like, hey, you know, you're so-and-so. We went to med school together. And um, she's just kind of stunned. And he's he's really trying hard. He's, he's, he's set up to be the nice guy. Um, and there's a couple of earlier scenes where there's some cat callers, the, the construction guys. I did and, like that moment because that's such a cliche concept, the, the cat calling construction worker guys yeah. and the fact that she just like stands there and stares at them yeah. and they start to make less comments and then they just get horribly creeped out and leave. Yeah, <laughs> they start calling her names. Yeah, That the, worked for me in a way that some of the other bits, because her thing is she'll go out on weekends and at first you don't know what she's doing because she has like a diary where she's keeping tabs and you're like, is she killing these people? But yeah, she, she pretends to be drunk. Uh, so men will, will try to take advantage of her, take her back to their apartments or whatever. And then she immediately, she's not drunk at all. She immediately sobers up and makes them feel horribly uncomfortable about what they're trying to do. Uh, with varying degrees of how bad what they're doing is, mm -hmm. to her it's all the same and it doesn't matter. Right. Um, but it, but we don't know at first if she's killing people or something because she has a little diary, she's keeping tabs, she's t keeping a tally. You're like, is she killing these people? It they're, turns out it's not that severe. No. The diary, the 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 check marks are color coded too, so it might be like red is more intense. Like, yeah, what they're uh, what they're trying to do. An actual attempt at rape, and then there's like. The scene with McLovin, yeah. um, and he's just like, I don't know what he does. He's just kind of being pushy, mm -hmm. and and so that might. I think get, he's just trying to kiss her or something. Yeah, yeah, that might get like a like a light blue, you know. But so she's yeah, she's doing that to what end? I don't know. Maybe just to shame them. Yeah, I think that's it. She's just trying to to fuck with these people so they don't do this to other people. Um, well, from the the perspective of like to call this a rape revenge movie, I mean that's a whole subgenre in like the seventies, eighties yeah. grindhouse kind of circuit. The most famous being "I Spit on Your Grave." 
But the point being, like, all those movies were made by men, and they are all, like, all the male characters are just monsters in it. So this is kind of a, a play on those type of movies, but it's directed by a female, written by a female. Um, so it has that different angle, which I think, again, lends to the sort of uh, dark comedy satirical angle of it. Yeah, it, it is a different look at those kinds of movies because um, she meets Bo Burnham, who I believe is a comedian. Yeah. Slash actor. And director. He directed a movie called oh, Eighth, Eighth Grade. Grade. Yeah. yeah. And so he shows up, and for all accounts, he's the nice guy. There is an embarrassing montage sequence that oh, very yeah. much so plays tongue in cheek, and I'm hoping that oh, it is. Oh, it, it feels like a like a romantic comedy sequence. Yes, yeah. and it's 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 if it's tongue in cheek. They're it's dancing brilliant. around the, uh, the, uh, the pharmacy, pharmacy. to yeah. a Paris Hilton song, like yeah. ironically dancing to a Paris Hilton song, and they're singing, and they keep cutting to that, and then they keep cutting them like like ha having breakfast in bed and oh, doing yeah. like everything's great, and yeah, and it's it's <laughs> really in your face, and I'm like, if this is real, I'm I'm cringed out, but if this <laughs> is this, if this is tongue in cheek and self aware, it's brilliant. Because, of course, then later on, that's when the movie gets darker. Yes, yeah. Uh, we discover spoilers. Did we say spoilers? I think we already said spoilers. Um, there uh, is a secret video given to her by her friend, Alison Brie. Actually, her ultimate goal is to get Alison Brie to cheat on her husband with a handsome man at the bar. Well, to make Alison think breathe, that think. She, yeah. she got raped. That, that's the thing, this movie keeps riding that line of like, is she gonna cross over into being just as awful yeah. as these people that she's, you know, uh, obsessed with, not obsessed with, but still feeling trauma from. Uh, she wants to put people, it's like, I don't know. Uh, um, God, what is like, I know what you did last summer. Like so, <laughs> uh, something in that vein where the, an event from the past. An event from the past comes back to haunt, and she's the she's the guy in the raincoat with the hook who, who's <laughs> making them all like kind of be forced to relive this event. So yeah. Alison Brie knew what happened, but she's like, "Oh, that was so long ago. That was like ten years ago." Like, Everybody's just trying to forget about it. Everyone's trying to forget they about it. They don't. They don't. The same with Connie Britton. They don't want to to, to confront, confront how awful it is. Yeah. yeah. But she has an old old timey cell phone that has a video of. The event, yeah. which thankfully they don't show. No, of course that not. That makes it more impactful. And uh, so they, they watch the video and you hear the sounds. It's like par party dude, frat dudes like laughing and, you know, so, and she has a horrified look on her face. Later on, we realize what the actual horrified look on her face is. It's because a good guy, all around good guy, Bo Burnham was there egging it on. He is now also a bad guy. And um, that's when she goes off the deep end. That's when she goes off the deep end, and that's when the movie gets fun. <laughs> fun in a very dark, horrible way. And it turns into a, a wacky 90s, 2000s rom-com. With this undercurrent of a horrible event. With, with a dark, sinister twist to it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's... Uh, that's where I was like on board hmm? as the, the middle was like, oh my God, <laughs> what is the tone here? I mean, and then and that's like the parents and uh, she lives at home with the parents and it's all set up like a wacky rom-com yeah. with, with that, that disturbing backstory. Um, so then the end of the film, they have a douchey bachelor party. They think she shows up in, in a clown wig and a, a sexy nurse outfit. And yeah. They think she's a stripper. Um, but she's there. She's there to uh, really give it to the guy. The guy is—I forget his character's name—but he—he's poised now to have a, a, a great, successful life. He's—he's he's now a doctor. He's about to get married. Uh, blah blah blah. Again, everybody wants to just forget about this event. They've moved on with their lives. She wants them to pay for it. So, yeah. I guess at this point, we won't discuss the ending. Because to me, that was the most shocking part. Uh, and it was the most hard right turn I've seen in a film in a while. Because you, you expect it to go a certain way, and it goes a very dark way. Yeah. And um, But still has a satisfying final moment, final conclusion. Oh, yeah, definitely. It's, it's, it's all very satisfying. And um, 
the inclusion of Max Greenfield in the film. Well, the doctor's here. You don't know him. He's, uh, he plays Schmidt on New Girl. He's more of a comedic actor. He's done some dramatic roles, but. Oh, he's the like best friend guy. He's the best yeah, friend yeah, yeah. who helps cover him up. When there's a moment when he realizes something and he, and he's, yeah. Like, and it's like, oh my God, it's Schmidt. And, it may, <laughs> it, and I feel like I'm watching a New Girl episode and, it, and it's just like, <laughs> what's going on? Schmidt. You. It's either a disastrous attempt to make a rape revenge film or a very genius execution of a rape revenge film done as a play on a dark comedy version <laughs> of an early 2000s rom-com. To me, that seemed if it's the exactly latter, like what they were doing. If it's the latter, I wholeheartedly recommend it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I would recommend it too. I thought it, it, I mean, I love dark comedy and you don't see a lot of them anymore. Um, I think because it is so hard to ride that line of, of having it be serious, but still have the humor work in a way that isn't a detriment to the, the, the series undertone. Yeah, a movie like this can easily have the opposite effect. If you make a movie about, you know, getting back at uh, the guy the guy or guys in college that had a drunken rape thing happen and you just it's just dirty and dark and uh, I gotta get them and uh, it could leave you with just like uh, just, just feeling gross feeling gross and, I mean and obviously some movies that's the intention but of this it, movie but... perfectly executes its message mm -hmm. in in kind of a dark and and strange and and fun way yeah to where to me it's more impactful I wanted to be a doctor my whole life lately I've been feeling like I might want to get back into it Should we go again? Yeah, third time's the charm. All right, maybe we'll get something a little more uplifting this time. Yeah. All right, and random. I'm not gonna look. Okay. I'm not gonna look. Okay. And stop. What is it? Oh, oh. Stop. Psycho Goreman. What? The fuck is that? It's Psycho Goreman. Psycho Gorman has left active service. His peace is short-lived when Felix Leiter, an old friend from the CIA, turns up asking for help, leading Psycho Gorman on the trail of a mysterious villain armed with a dangerous new technology. Wow. Mm. Well, that was certainly different. That was the strangest take on a rape revenge film I've ever seen. This is a little bit of tonal whiplash from uh following up Promising Young Woman with that. Promising Young Space Monster named Psycho Gorman from the guys behind Astron 6. One of them. The guy behind Astron 6, the, the Canadian movie making company that has produced such hit films as the editor and Man Borg and Divorced Dad, the web series. Which I don't know if you can watch that anywhere. I know there's a Blu-ray of it, but it's not on YouTube, I don't think. <sighs> I haven't seen any of this. Oh, no, I saw some Divorced Dad. We watched one episode. I've seen the whole thing. It's amazing. If you can find Divorced Dad, watch it. Well, I guess we should say right off, right off the bat, then, full disclosure. Full disclosure. Uh, we do have a very, very tiny connection to this film. Our friend and lover, Rich Evans, has a very brief uh, voice cameo in the film. He does. The rumors are true. Yeah. He's in the end credits, but the rumors are true. Rich voices, uh, I don't know the name. The character has a name, which is nice, uh, but he's, his, he plays a character that is just a giant metal bucket filled with human body parts and blood. And he just shoot, has two cannons for arms that just shoot blood out. Yeah. But uh, yeah, he has a couple lines and he even gets a, a patented Rich Evans, oh my God, in there. It, yeah, he squeezes it in. That's yeah, pretty great. But that's the only connection we have to the film. That's the only connection. Nobody we have involved to. with it has reached out to us to promote it or review it or anything. But Jay, what, what did you think of Psycho Gorman? I loved Psycho Gorman. 
Uh, I thought it was hilarious. I thought it was, I don't want to say clever, but it, it, it's very, like a lot of Astron 6's stuff, it's very, uh, what it's kind of paying homage to or spoofing or referencing is, is such a niche kind of subgenre. Uh, that's always the case with their stuff. Uh, the Editor is a movie I like that is, it's a, a spoof of Italian giallo films and it would be incomprehensible to someone that is unfamiliar with those type of movies. Uh, this is a little broader. It's very like 80s, 90s, uh, kind of like Amblin type movies. Uh, there's a bit of that. But I thought it was uh, very creative with all the creatures. It was much more ambitious than I was expecting. Because you hear the premise, it's called PG, which is a funny title, because it's an R-rated violent movie. But PG is a takeoff of E.T. And it's like, oh, what if the kids from E.T. befriended this, this giant monster that destroys planets because he's just pure evil. But alas, they are not the kids from E.T. No, which I think is a sticking point for a lot of people. Mainly me. <laughs> no, I think that's the thing is it's it's sort of the, the it's a brother and sister, older brother, younger sister. And because uh, I, I helped Rich record his voiceover for his sequence. And so I saw one scene from the movie, the scene that Rich is in while I was helping him record the voice. They sent us a digital file of it. And uh, when I saw the little girls acting, my initial reaction was kind of like, oh. PG, are these silly little guys your friends? Why don't you introduce us? You don't look very friendly. This is our main character. Gee, this is going to get uh, annoying after a while. But in the context of the movie, I actually thought she was hilarious. And I know other people have said they found her incredibly annoying. But she's just this, like, selfish weirdo that I thought was very funny. In, like, a Cartman way. Where Cartman's, like, an annoying little asshole. But he's funny. Yeah, to me, I think... That element and the the weird kind of humor brought about from the parents. I, I don't know. This I, I like this movie a lot. I I particularly like the costumes, of course. Yes, that's the big standout. Is the amazing, amazing costumes and creativity, and and the wonderful little backstories of all the. The time Psycho Gorman has destroyed worlds. A lot of world building and mythology in what is ultimately a really stupid comedy, right. which, which, which elevates it. it. It's, yeah, all that stuff is super creative and fun. Yeah, um, and I like the idea of uh, little kids on Earth befriending a, a violent, monstrous alien, because they, they take it to the limit. He has no redeeming qualities. <laughs> Uh, he is just, His backstory kind of gives you a little bit of uh, yeah, understanding yeah, 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 of him. Yeah, yeah. He was uh, like a slave, and uh, he broke free, and yeah. But but he's just basically pure evil. He, he just goes from planet to planet and and destroys everyone. He's like a Thanos kind of. Yeah, yeah. Although he, Thanos has more of an Thanos. agenda. Yeah, yeah. He's he's the skin of evil from the Tasha Yar death episode. We believe everything in the universe has a right to exist. An interesting notion which I do not share. I won't even bother <laughs> explaining it. Um, but yeah, he is uh, uh, just an awful, awful monster, and the dialogue is so great, and the, his voice altering, yeah. and the costume. The look of the costume is great. Uh, I saw a tweet from Pat Oswalt, our, our dear friend Pat Oswalt, who actually will be returning for another episode of Best of the Worst. He had such a great time before. Any other, any slumming celebrities? Like, I'm gonna be real. I'm gonna connect with the uh, YouTube generation. I'm gonna go on this fucking, no. This is a fucking nightmare. <laughs> Holy <laughs> doing the But uh, he, he tweeted that you're either going to love or loathe it. And I think I'm probably a, in the small minority of people that are in the middle mm. to where I, I, kind of, I kind of get that humor. It's stuff that we've done before. Because I, I have a particular taste in bizarre, stretched out jokes, awkward comedy, anti-humor. Yeah. We put plenty of it in our film Space Cop. We talked about this before, the, the scene where Space Cop opens his refrigerator lock. And 
it's like a, a 900 digit combination <laughs> and it does it for, for 10 minutes. That's where I, everybody says, oh, this is going to be the movie. Right. Well, I think, I think the problem with that in Space Cop is that's a long stretched out uh, non-joke. Like it just keeps going on. But that comes right after, speaking of Patton, it comes after the Patton scene, which is also a scene that goes on way too long. <laughs> oh man, that never gets old. That never gets old. You have two of them back to back. It's almost like you have to do one or the other. Yeah. And we went and did both because we're insane and indulgent. Um, but in this movie, I think they knew which moments to extend, which moments to, to have kind of that, that non sequitur anti-humor and which ones to keep the story moving forward. Right. Uh, certain jokes fell very flat to me. Mainly, I think with the dad, I get his arc was that he was he was like lazy and he gave bad advice. The scene where he gives the bad advice is pretty funny. Well, that's yeah, that's right out of something we would do. Yeah. Because it's, it's taking, the whole movie is taking these kind of 80s and 90s movie tropes, very like conventional story beats and just t turning it up to absurdity. Right, right. Um, and so I liked some of that stuff, but then there's certain things that just st stood out, like him eating the chicken, overcooking the chicken. And... Well, he just cooks the chicken in the microwave. Yeah. And everyone's like, it's kind of tough. Right. And so like, I don't know. And then it's like awkward silence and da, 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 da. There was one particular scene that I was really expecting them to to drag out, and I probably would have laughed, was the scene where Psycho Gorman realizes the sister is awful, and he he, he feels like he can ally himself with the brother. Oh yeah, the, the cemetery dream sequence. Yeah, the, so the, the only way he could talk to the brother is in his nightmares. <laughs> which <is> funny. <laughs> which there's zombies there, because why not? The kid's having a nightmare, his bed is in a graveyard, and there's zombies. <laughs> yeah, this is the only place I could talk to you. And so the kid turns down his offer to betray the sister and give him the, the gem that controls him um, that they dig up in their backyard. Yeah. And then um, he's like, so what happens now? He's like, well, we have to wait till your dream is over. Till you wake up. One, two, cut. Yeah, I was really surprised that didn't get dragged out. Just cut to that wide shot for an extended period of time with these zombies moaning. Right, and then you just you just leave it. Yeah. You just leave that camera on, and, and I love <laughs> stuff like that. And then I lo also love bait and switches, or double reverse bait and switches, I'm okay with. <laughs> the uh, uh, There's a scene where uh, Psycho Gorman kills the paladins, the, his old team. Yeah. And um, one of them is like a witch doctor, like a sorcerer, and she gets her head cut off, mm -hmm. but the head is like rolling down the street and it's still alive. And it's like, I'm, I, I may have nobody, but I can start over with my head. And then here comes the, the pickup truck. Perfect setup for a bait and switch, and they didn't do it. Yeah. That, that was a miss. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, humor more than anything else is so subjective, especially a movie like this where there's so many different types of humor. It's hard to, it's hard to like pinpoint what works and what doesn't because it's going to be different for everybody. Yeah. Um, most of it worked for me. Uh, there was a couple moments like that didn't work, but a lot of it did. Yeah, and we've also also talked a lot about what we've dubbed the Chad Vader effect. Mm -hmm. We haven't yet come up with a better term for it. There's an old web series called Chad Vader, uh, which I think was made in Wisconsin. Yeah. Madison. Yeah. Um, and so the joke is that there's a guy named Chad Vader who looks and sounds just like Darth Vader and uh, he does wacky things. He works in a grocery store. Weak-minded fool. Your power's nothing compared to Chad me. Vader to aisle five for vomit cleanup. Chad to aisle five for vomit. So, so the, the concept is when you take a dark, imposing figure and you have them do wacky things, it's instantly funny. Right. Um, similar to fish out of water humor. When someone's taken out of their element, uh, and put in some a different element where they don't understand it, instant funny. So lots of instant funnies with Psycho Gorman. Um, he mostly sticks to a serious character though, which helps a lot. Yeah. They, they don't push him too far into the goofy stuff. No. There's, there's one moment that works perfectly because they don't do it a whole lot, which is when the, the little girl, Mimi is her name, and she they're just like, they're having him stay at this warehouse because they don't know what to do with him. And she's just giving him things to, like, gives him, like, a TV, stuff to, to do so he's not bored. She gives him a magazine, and there's, a like, a shirtless dude in it. And just this line of, like, I don't care for hunky boys. 
And then he starts to question his sexuality. Or do I? <laughs> That, that low angle shot when he looks down. Before, yeah. Do I? That, and it, I, that's perfect because they don't do too many moments like that. Yeah. I do not care for hunky boys. Or do I? We're Most of the time he's dark that. and imposing, and the humor comes more from the contrast between him and the kids. He's telling these long, elaborate stories about his. His journeys throughout the galaxy, and they just couldn't give a shit. They're bored. They're at a diner at one point. He starts to tell his story. We start to go into the flashback, and they just completely cut him off. <laughs> yeah, and that stuff's fun. I think the the formula of the the dark, imposing figure being controlled by kids who are relatively oblivious to his powers is great. Um, like uh, I think a lot of people out there, the, the problem comes in with the little girl. And this is where you tread lightly because the little girl is a real person who's in a movie who probably sees lots of comments about how she's terrible. It's not her fault. She did her best. It's the direction and the writing. So yeah, you, you don't want to dog on the, the little kid, but that's where, that's, that was the sticking point for me, is I didn't find her endearing or funny. I found her grating and annoying. And it's a tricky thing, like I thought she was hilarious, but it's a tricky thing where, like you can say that, and I can counter it with, well that's the point. And it's like, well is that enough to justify it? For me it did. Uh, I like the, con because I think you would like it if they were more just straight good kids throughout the whole thing, right? It, well you have to, it's a yin yang kind of thing. It has to balance out. And when you tip the scale, like if the parent, you don't want it to be dull, but if the parents are eccentric and weird and the kids are also eccentric and weird, and then you contrast them with the dark imposing monster, like, you know, you're, we're thinking like uh, movies, the, there's a lot of movies like this where a, a thing, Harry and the Hendersons, you know, your ETs, um, I guess Mac and me, I've never seen it. Have you seen E.T.? I've seen E.T. I've seen Mac and me. Although I should point out, there's a much darker alternate ending to this film that was not seen in U.S. theaters and we're gonna show a clip from it right now. They don't know how to drive anyway! Stop him! Yeah, so if Mimi was more of a, a Gertie, where she like really liked to dress up Psycho Gorman in a costume. I mean, there is a scene in E.T. where E.T. wears a lady's clothes, mm -hmm. a little tea party. She has a tea party with E.T. And there and is it, a 90s changing clothes montage in this movie. There is a, a, a montage, which is pretty fun. I mean, that's fair. To me, it worked because you have the older, first of all, I like that it's the older brother and the younger sister is the one that's kind of the the alpha between the two. She's the one bossing him around, which is a nice little twist. But I, I think that, that he's the one that balances that out, where he's just super normal kid to the point where Psycho Gorman can never remember his name, which is a funny running gag. Yeah, um, that's funny. But the the idea that this, this I, I liked her delivery. I liked how bratty she was because she's just such a like selfish weirdo. And she's like the worst kid that could possibly take control of Psycho Gorman. And so I think that adds, like, I think if it was played more straight, where the two kids are just normal, like, Amblin kids, I, I think the movie would run out of steam. And I think the way it is, it, it kind of keeps the story from getting dull, or from the joke from running out, because it could easily become a one-joke movie. And if I, if I did have a, my biggest complaint about the movie is the third act takes place almost entirely in that warehouse, which is a boring location and it wears out its welcome, because it's like the last half hour we're stuck in that place. No pun intended. I just think, I think the movie excelled in nerdy creativity, but lagged behind in the art and artistry of properly balancing the joke. Mm. I think as far as it being a, a very accessible comedy, 
um, it, it is very cultish and very niche. Oh yeah. And I, I think the reason that is the case is because um, of the the inability to make it accessible to all audiences mm -hmm. in in the premise. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't as like horrifically gory and over the top as I was expecting. No, there was some stuff early on. He rips off some people's heads. There's the guy that he basically frees. He doesn't kill him. He makes him just like live in constant agony where his yeah. eyes are rolling around in his head. I think the most disturbing thing was uh, when they plucked a random human from Earth and put her in the cube. Oh yeah. That shrunk just, down and <laughs> just squishes her. Yeah, weird stuff like that. Um, <laughs> that's where the movie excels. Yeah. But that, that delicate balance between how your human characters could act versus the interaction with the, the spacey, science fiction-y parts is is a very very careful balancing act and i think they were a little too indulgent and in, let's make the dad say weird things yeah. let's make the mom do this let's make the little girl crazy um, we also have just playing off of conventions and then yeah which is a that's why like it reminded me a lot of like the, which is which is a form of parody yeah i suppose uh, but like like the david wayne wet hot american summer where it's like if you if you don't get specifically the type of like tropes that they're kind of poking fun at, then it completely falls apart. And this this is similar to me to something like a Wet Hot American Summer, yeah. where it's like you really have to be dialed in to what they're doing, or it just comes across completely nonsensical. Sure, <laughs> definitely the Wet Hot American Summer test. Mm -hmm. uh, that's of course a movie that I love, that I laugh. Hysterically. One of the funniest yeah. movies yeah. ever made. Um, like the we're going into town. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they, they binge on heroin and, uh, and things go out of control. And then they come back an hour later and everything's fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the guy's stand-up routine at the end, um, yeah, so killed old me. So fucking Jesus Christ was my camp counselor. Uh, he laughed so hard I couldn't breathe. <laughs> I went to camp so long ago that fucking Jesus Christ was my counselor. And my best friend hadn't fully evolved yet. There were two epidemics when I went to camp. Head lice and the plague. The bubonic plague. But that's a case where, I don't know what you would call that, because it's not what he's saying that's funny. It's the fact that it's, the fact that it's not funny. And it just keeps going on, and it's everybody's a, laughing hysterically. It's a, it's a form of anti-humor. It's a, yeah, it's a play on conventions. Right. Um, Anti-humor I love. Yeah. Um, have you watched uh, Tim Heidecker's stand-up? We saw Tim Heidecker's stand-up. No, no, no. There's a new special that's on YouTube. Oh, no. Uh, I don't know what it's called. When we saw him, he was playing like an angry, coked-up comic, which yeah, was yeah, funny. Yeah. Um, but he has a new, new stand-up that's virtually all... Um, anti-humor okay and um he's he's playing more like forgetful and awkward mm. and just bad at being a stand-up <laughs> like like the opening is him coming out and uh like like doing the co comedic thing hey everybody how, how you doing and then he knocks over the microphone and then for like maybe a good five minutes it's him futzing around trying to <laughs> fix the microphone and then getting so mad that he storms off stage um and so you know there I am laughing hysterically at that. Um, so I love anti-humor, I love strange humor, but it's it's one of those weird things that can't specifically be defined. Sure. Your case, you found the little girl hilarious. Me, I found it grating and out of place and annoying. Sure. And then some of the things towards the end, we always talk about setups and payoffs. For example, the hunky guy. Yes. Hunky guy magazine. I don't care about hunky guys, or do I? <laughs> Funny. Then later during the battle, somebody rips, accidentally rips the hunky guy magazine. Mm -hmm. And he said, not my hunky guy. Didn't work. What are you doing there? It, What's work, that? it works as a one-off. It works as a one-off, yeah. yeah. And then um, uh, I guess bringing up the song, they, they play that rock song. Yeah. And then at the end, she starts singing it, a slow version of that rock song. It's supposed to be like a, a joke on like an emotional, even though everything is completely nonsensical and yeah. the song is stupid. It was, it was a, uh, that was a play on what is a cliche in yeah. those kinds of movies. But for me, I was like, that rock song was so long ago. 
I don't even remember, so uh, my brain was like, what is she singing? <laughs> I'm the heckin' best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Freak all the rest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now if, if uh, the first act of the movie was the little kids trying to win the battle of the bands at their junior high school. And they practiced this song a lot and they all worked on it together. Psycho Gorman was giving them advice on lyrics. How about the next verse goes, slaughter those who are weaker than you. No, 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 Psycho Gorman. Let's change it. And we really worked on that song. Then you bring that song up at the end and then it, it perks Psycho Gorman's attention. They remember that moment, but sure. really it happened in a montage as a joke. It felt like a one-off joke is what you're then saying. Then it's brought up at the end as an emotional arc. I mean, you could really, like, you could analyze this film in terms of comedy and why things work and why they don't. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they could work for some people and not for the others. So I think what we're saying is if you actually liked Space Cop, you'll probably like this film. And if you didn't like Space Cop, you'll probably like this film. Yes, Jay, this is a, a noteworthy day. A, the first film we've reviewed that has had one of our own in it. Kind uh, of. Kind of. Yeah. Kind of, very, very small part, but uh, Rich did do a voice. And if I were a true sleazy dirtbag ass kisser, I would probably say, this film's great, everybody check it out. You know, <laughs> you know but I give my honest opinion. I liked a lot of it. Uh, some stuff was, was cringy and didn't work, um, but uh, I certainly enjoyed all of the, the creativity and uh, all, the, all that kind of stuff put into it. And Old school miniatures and stop motion. And yeah. Every, every trick yeah. in the book, yeah, all, all, which all, all, visually has its charm. It doesn't look real. It's not like slick effects, but they right. look great for what they're supposed to be. All that stuff that, that you and I uh, have done before that we both really like, that, that really kind of dark, twisted humor. <laughs> um, just for some reason, a good chunk of it didn't quite work for me, but a, a lot of it did. So yeah, I'd, I'd probably recommend it, mainly because our audience kind of shares the same humorous humor style that we do. Yeah. Also, um, it is a movie that uh, I haven't seen anything like it. That's, yeah, that's the final positive for me, is that it's just completely original and different. Yeah. There's a new god in town, and his name? Psycho Gorman. It was nice meeting you. It would be nicer if you were dead. All right, bye. Phone ringing? It's me, it's, it's Mr. Plinkin. I, I went to the Packers Buccaneers game. I took the senior bus that left from the library. The, 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 those fuckers left without me. Hello? Hello?
I asked a youth how to use an Uber, but but that that, that prick stole my phone. I'm calling out a burner phone that I used to buy Viagra illegally from China. Hello? Hello? Well, this goddamn phone ain't got no apps on it. I push the screen, it just leaves fingerprints. Hello? 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 No. If you and Jay want to take a wacky road trip up to Lambeau Field to pick me up, well then I'm sure we'll all have a fantabulous adventure. Hello? What's that? You want my wallet? 